So, we arrived yesterday, well, <clears throat> at a statement of the fundamental dynamical principle of quantum mechanics, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation here. I didn't yet justify, I didn't offer any justification for this at this time. The justification or, or arguments which will make this seem plausible are about to come, but they have not yet come. However, um, we already, at the end of, of yesterday's lecture, realized that if a, if a psi, if the state of our system is such that the energy is well determined, is, is, uh, is the, the result of measuring energy is certain, then the time evolution of that state is absolutely trivial. Uh, the state evolves only in that its phase increments uh, at a rate with a frequency, an angular frequency, e upon h bar, which is typically very large because h bar is very small. And we went on from that result there to show that the solution to this equation for any state of psi uh, takes this form, that uh, the, state, the, the, um, the state of the system at an arbitrary time is this, is this sum over the states of well-determined energy, where a n as ever is e n evaluated at So if you evaluate these coefficients at time t equals naught, or indeed at any time at your convenience, um, then just by inserting into this sum, this ordinary sum which we've seen a few times of a psi expanded in terms of a complete set of states, if we just insert these exponential factors, bingo, we evolve the state according to that equation. So that makes these states of well-defined energy of crucial operational significance. And the result of that is that we spend a great deal of time solving the defining equation of these, of these states, which is that HEN is equal to EN EN. These states of well-defined energy are by construction eigenstates of the Hamiltonian operator. Uh, and this is the time-independent Schrodinger equation to distinguish it from the time-dependent up there. So only states of well uh, of definite energy solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation, uh, any state, the state of our system, always has to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So what we want to do now, the, the next item on the agenda fundamentally, is to provide some justification, make it seem plausible that that is the correct equation of motion. And a good way to do that is to link back to classical mechanics. So recall classical mechanics, classical physics is that limit where, we, where the uncertainty in w the values of dynamical variables is sufficiently small that it isn't necessary to calculate the whole probability distribution. It's enough to know what the expectation value of the probability distribution is um, because the true value will be very close to the expectation value and we ordinarily don't distinguish uh, between the expectation value and the true value when doing classical physics. So what we want to do is calculate d by dt of the expectation value of some observable, I think, I think we're calling observables Q. Uh, and let's put an IH bar in front of here just in order to um, clarify, sorry, in order to simplify the algebra. So we're trying to calculate this, the rate of change of the expectation value of something. This something might be position, so this might be X, this might be momentum, it might be energy, it might be whatever you want to know, it might be angular momentum, whatever you want to know about the system. Uh, this would tell you the rate of change of the classical value of that variable, because the classical value is the expectation value. So what is that? What is that? Well, this is just a trip, this is just a product. So obviously it comes into three parts, IH bar, d psi by dt times q times psi plus, um, uh, let's take the last bit now, no, no, uh, plus a psi dq, dq by dt, sorry, these things probably should be, oh, were there?
Whether we make these things partial derivatives or total derivatives is, is of no significance. This is clearly a total derivative because this thing doesn't depend on anything except time. Uh, whether we make these partial or total is, is very unimportant. So here we have an IH bar rate of change of psi, so this can immediately be replaced by H of psi. Here we have the bra of psi and the original equation. We can, take, we, can, we can take the Hermitian adjoint of the original equation when it becomes minus IH bar d by dt of the bra of psi. This is bra of psi <coughs> equals of psi h. Remember the rule when we take emission adjoints is we reverse the order of the symbols and we, uh, and we take the adjoints of the individual bits. H is an h uh, is an observable, so it's a emission operator. So h equals h dagger. So I can pop those into here and here. So the first two terms give me including the IH bar. Um, this one is going to be minus a psi H. So that is IH bar D by DT of the bra of psi times Q times a psi. And this one, the I, including the IH bar, this is going to be plus a psi QH. And then we have a trailing bit here, which will be plus IH bar Q, sorry, a psi dQ by dt psi. And these two can be handily combined together into a commutator because there's a minus sign here, otherwise the order of the Q and the H are swapped around. So this can be written as, Q, as a psi, the commutator Q comma H psi, and then this is plus i h bar. Oops. So this result goes by the name of Ehrenfest's theorem. And it's one of the more important results of quantum mechanics. In most of our applications, we can forget about this, because what is this last term here? It's the expectation value of the rate of change of your observable. So if the observable was, for example, x, it would have no rate of change. x is x is x. It's always the same operator. If your observable were p, it would have no rate of change, because the momentum, momentum is momentum is momentum. It doesn't change. The, our understanding of what momentum is doesn't change from moment to moment. If it were angular momentum, it doesn't change from moment to moment. So this, this term here usually falls away. And so, so if d psi, sorry, dq by dt equals naught, which is the normal state of affairs, then ugh, we have that IH bar um, d by dt of the expectation value of Q, which is often written like this in shorthand notion, notation, right? We've left out the psi either side, just leave the angle brackets, which means the expectation value in any state whatsoever, is equal to the expectation value of the commutator Q comma H. OK, what does that tell us? It tells us immediately that if an observable commutes with the Hamiltonian, if Q commutes with H, that being the same thing as Q comma H equals naught, then clearly the expectation value of Q is always constant. And physicists are always very excited by quantities which are constant. So we call it, what do we call it in classical physics? We'd call it a constant of motion. Famously, Newton said that if you didn't go for messing with particles, the momentum 
was constant, or maybe he said the velocity was constant, right? So velocity is a constant of motion. We now would re reinterpret that as momentum is constant. Uh, we often know that angular momentum is, of, of the angular momentum of the Earth is almost constant insofar as it's not acted on too much by the moon, and so on and so forth. So, we're, so physics is full of constants of motion. They're very important. In quantum mechanics, there's a special notation around here, which is to say that um, we say that Q, the eigenvalue of this, is a good quantum number. So if somebody says that angular momentum is a good quantum number, they're simply saying angular momentum is a constant of the motion. We can go further than that, though, because um, so we've shown that the expectation value of Q is constant. We could show easily that the expectation value of Q squared um, is constant, too. It's very straightforward. It's obviously the case because Q squared is an observable. If Q commutes with the Hamiltonian, then Q squared has to commute with the Hamiltonian. So Q squared is also a constant of the motion. That means that if you start, so this implies that if, if initially, uh, if at t equals naught, a psi is one of the states of well-defined Q, so QR, one of the eigenstates of the operator Q, so we know for certain the result of a measurement will be QR, then what does that mean? That means that at t equals naught, the expectation value of Q is obviously equal to QR, and the expectation value of Q squared is equal to QR squared, which implies that the variance of Q, you know, the, the, so var, that implies that the variance of Q, which is as ever defined to be the expectation value of Q squared or, uh, minus the expectation of Q itself squared vanishes. So this variance may, expresses, of course, the, the fact that there's no uncertainty in, in, the, in the value that we get. But this, since this is a constant of the motion and this is the constant of the motion, if this variance vanishes at t equals naught, it vanishes at all times. And the only way that that can happen is if your system stays in the state that it was in originally. So if it was in a state of well-defined Q, at the beginning of at t equals naught, it'll be in the state of well-defined Q at all subsequent times. So that's why, that's the meaning of this good, that's why people talk about good quantum number. If I know at some particular time that the angular momentum of this isolated body is h-bar or whatever, then I know that at all later times it's also h-bar. It's a quantum number worth knowing because it's always valid information. So. So we're very interested in quantities in observables that commute with the Hamiltonian. Let's move over here for the next point. Um, yep. Yeah. Obviously, OK, so we're interested in things that commute with the Hamiltonian. And a trivial observation is that H H comma H equals naught. This is a bad place, isn't it? <clears throat> I'm not sure there's anything we can do about it. Um, so the Hamiltonian commutes with itself, which means that the expectation value of H is a constant if dH by dt equals naught. So I'm, now we need to come back to this point that we, I said, usually it's going to be the case that the partial derivative of Q with respect to time, I've lost it, it's up there somewhere, the partial derivative of Q with respect to time vanishes. Now the Hamiltonian is an interesting case where that isn't necessarily the case. There are very important uh, um, Circumstances in which the Hamiltonian does explicitly depend on time, the, the expression for the energy depends on time. For example, um, if, you, uh, 
if you, if you put a particle in a time-varying magnetic field, the expression for the Hamiltonian, to, which the, and the Hamiltonian is going to depend on the magnetic field, depends on time. And in those circumstances, the energy of the particle is not going to be constant. And the reason is you're working on you, That time depends on the Hamiltonian, reflects the work that you're doing on the particle. But if, you, if the Hamiltonian is independent of time, so that will reflect you're not doing any work, and then the expectation value of H equals constant is conservation of energy. So this condition, it will turn out, is intimately connected to whether or not you're working on the particle. Now, let's have a look at the, um, the rate of change of the expectation value of any observable when we are in a state, when a psi happens to be a state of well-defined energy. Right? So these states of well-defined energy, we've explained that they're, going to be, that they're the key to solving the, the central equation of the theory. So let's ask ourselves a little bit about those states. So the, so, uh, the amplitude, let's, ha let's have a look at Q um, E. Right? This is the amplitude to determine Q, to, on, you know, given that we're in the state E. Well, this is an eigen, this is an eigen, well, let's, give it, let's give it its N, QN. So this, is, so this is the amplitude to find the value QN if you would measure with the observable Q, given that you're in a state with well-defined energy E. Let's work out the time derivative of this. IH bar d by dt of this quantity is equal to, oh, dear, this, is, this is so, it's very specific. <laughs> dqn by dt. I wonder if we should turn this off. Is there any way we can turn it down? No. Let's try. So we do the same thing. Uh, this has to be um, IH bar thing we get from the Hermitian adjoint of the of the equation, and we get the time-dependent Schrödinger equation. So we get a minus QN H. So that is that, and then we E onto it, <coughs> and this is going to be <coughs> QN stands by. Well, that, including the IH bar, produces an H E. And this is nothing very much, right? Because H works on E to produce E, because that's an eigenstate of H. E times the ket E, banged into this, produces minus E times Q and E. And this H produces an E, and so we get a plus E times Q and E. So these two terms cancel. So we've discovered that the rate of change of the amplitude to have the value Qn is constant. The rate of change vanishes. This amplitude Qn E is constant for oops, any Q. So in order to obtain this result, we didn't make any restriction any restriction whatsoever on what the observable Q was. So, <coughs> so the remarkable fact is that in these states of well-defined energy, if your system has well-defined energy, all its property, the expectation value of every <coughs> observable, and by thinking about, you know, in fact, it then follows with a, a couple of extra steps, the probability distribution of measuring any observable whatsoever is completely constant. Nothing ever changes. So that leads to E being called stationary state. <coughs> These states really are forever. They are completely eternal. They are completely unchanging. They are not of this world. Right? <coughs> 
And in particular, you can never get a system into, it follows from this, that you can never get a system into a state of well-defined <coughs> because if you, it's going into there would reply, imply that something was changing. But we can <coughs> they never change. <coughs> That's kind of a remarkable one. So now we have a new, a new topic, um, the position representation. bring us much closer to the real physical world, as far as reaching it. So, so far we've talked about, we use abstract representations that are a little bit like the energy representation. Uh, let's say we've assumed that our observable has discrete spectrum. So the spectrum is made up of uh, discrete numbers. The thing about the position operator, <coughs> This is the thing made up of. Uh, <coughs> I mean, this is the this is the, the, the operator which encodes um, the states of well-defined position down the x-axis. Uh, this has a, it has a spectrum which is usually always <coughs> continuous. It runs from minus infinity to infinity. It's not discrete. It's continuous, and this requires some some adjustment. So, we, um, we used to write, we have been writing, let's divide the board, we have been writing that psi is equal to sum a n, shall we say, e n, we use the energy representation. Now we're going to write that psi is equal to an integral, that sum over the discrete set of possible the discrete values numbers in the spectrum becomes an integral over the possible values in the spectrum, so that's from minus infinity to infinity, um, <coughs> of some amplitude, the amplitude to be at x times the state of well-defined definitely being at x. So this is the state uh, that the system is in when it is at x, when our particle or whatever is at x, and this is the amplitude to be at x, right? Amplitude. at x, and this is the state of being at x, we used to have that E m E n equals delta m. <coughs> what are we going to have now? Let's draw this thing through by x prime, and we're going to have the integral dx prime uh, Sorry, the x, x primed x of psi of x. This side, whoops, this side is clearly equal to psi. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And what do we want? What we want is that this, well, it's obvious that this thing vanishes except when x prime is equal to x because if it's definitely an x, um, sorry. Yeah, if it's definitely at x, then it certainly isn't at x prime if x prime is different from x. So this thing here is nothing except when x equals x prime. Um, and uh, it must be it must be non-zero and presumably rather large in order that uh, well, I think we can sorry, we can fill this in. This is what is this? By definition, this is the amplitude to be at x prime. And I've already said that that is the amplitude to be at x prime. Sorry, x. So it's clear that this thing here is psi of x prime, the amplitude to be at x prime. So we have that the amplitude of the psi of x prime, that function, is equal to dx of x prime x of psi of x. <coughs> and I hope that you, I'm sure you've already met this uh, relationship. As these lectures, that this can also be written as x delta of x prime minus x psi of x. So we have so that result up there has been generalized or has morphed into <coughs> the statement that x prime x is equal to a Dirac <coughs> rather than a Kronecker delta delta root x minus x prime.
we used to have that a psi psi was the sum of the a n squares was one by conservation of probability that this was the sum of the probabilities to get the value e n and since you had to get some value that sum of probabilities had to be one now what do we have what does this turn into um, this, this turn this relation here turns into a psi a psi should be one and how do we how do we express it like this we say that this is the integral uh, dx of a psi x x <laughs> So where we're, here we're using the idea, sorry, that we, we used to have that the sum E n E n <coughs> is the identity operator. Now we have that the integral dx x x is the identity operator. So every all of these sums get are turning into integrals. So uh, this relationship uh, becomes this because uh, because this is the identity operator snuck into there, and this is what is the amplitude to be at x. So we already call that the wave function of psi of x. This is the complex conjugate of that, therefore the complex conjugate of this. So this becomes the integral dx of mod psi squared. So the integral of mod psi squared should be one. Um, in this continuous ring. So these are just natural transformations of what we've already done in the discrete case to the continuous case. And one more thing that we need to write down. We used to have, um, we used to have that if a psi <coughs> was the sum a n e n and phi was the sum B n, E n, then the complex number uh, phi psi was the sum B n star A n, sum of n. Right? That's, that's a result we have had. What's the analogous thing here? The analogous thing here is going to be the phi psi is going to be the integral. Into here we stick an identity operator, uh, the integral dx of, of ket x bri x. So this becomes the integral dx, so we stick an identity operator into that gap um, of phi x x of psi. This is what we have been calling the wave function of psi of x. It is the amplitude to be at x, which is it is a function. It is a function of x. It's a complex number depending on x, psi of x. And by analogy, we should call we should call x of psi x phi. Sorry, we should call the wave function phi x. That being so, this becomes the complex conjugate of it, and this becomes an integral dx. So, so that both of these things, of course, are functions of x. So this is this is. This is precisely a transformation of that, where the sum, where n has been replaced by x, and the sum of n becomes an integral of x. This, this is the stuff we have to do because the spectrum of x is continuous, not discrete. Let's just do a little practice with this by asking ourselves. Um, how does the operator x work on, on an arbitrary state of psi in this representation? So what we want to know is, the thing to do is to ask ourselves, what wave function represents that? That is to say, what is this complex number as a function of x? So here's the operator x, here is an arbitrary value of x. I would like to know what the amplitude to be at x is for this state that you get 
when <coughs> the operator x works on the general wave function x. When you see an operator x, the obvious thing to do is to stick into here an identity operator made up of the eigenfunctions of x. So in order to understand what this is, what we do is we slide into here one of these identity operators. X is busy, so my identity operator is going to have to be a sum of x prime, some new value, some, some independent value of x. X, x, x primed, x primed, sum. So, so here's the identity operator along with that. Now life is relatively straightforward because f, this is an eigenfunction of that operator with this eigenvalue. That's the definition of this algorithm here. So when x meets this, it produces simply x times x primed, the number times the ket x primed. So this becomes the integral dx primed of x primed. There's the eigenvalue popped out. Then we have x, x primed. And this we recognize to be the wave function of psi evaluated on x primed. But this we recognize now, we've seen that this is the Dirac delta function of x minus x primed. So when we do the integration over x primed, this ensures that we get no contribution except at that split second when x primed is equal to x. Um, well, uh, and we get the value of the integrand evaluated if these x primes turned into x. So this is equal to x from psi of x. So at the end of a long story, what have we discovered? We've discovered that the wave function associated with, with the result of using the operator x on some state is simply x times the wave function of the original state. We can express that. The way to remember that is to say that the operator acts on wave functions by ordinary multiplication. <coughs> so don't, you don't usually go through this kind of performance. You, you, you know what's going to happen when you do it. But that's the logical basis for this, for this statement. Let's introduce another very important operator, um, the momentum operator. Now I'm going to make an unsubstantiated claim about what this operator, how this operator looks in the position representation. I don't expect you to think, aha, that makes sense. It doesn't make sense. It's a complete leap in the dark. We will understand later, considerably later, why these operators take the form that they do. Um, but I hope soon to build more confidence that it makes some kind of sense. But that what we're going to do just right now is a complete leap in the dark. Uh, I'm going to say, well, let's investigate the operator. I, I happen to know it's the momentum, but let's investigate it, uh, which is defined thus. <coughs> now let's just make sure we understand functionally what's happening here. An operator fundamentally is something which turns a state into another state. When we're in the position representation, we are um, when we're in the position representation, we are um, <laughs> we're working with functions. Our way are our states are represented by their wave functions, which is the amplitude d at x. <coughs> so the x operator, the x operator has to um, turn a wave function of psi into some other function and look, x of psi is another function. It depends on x in a different way from the way of psi does. So similarly, this momentum of this operator, I claim is the momentum operator without any basis, I'm going to try again. This momentum operator <coughs> is 
is turning the wave function of psi into its derivative. A derivative is a function different from the function we first thought of. So indeed, it's turning a function into a function. So that's kind of, it means it is at least a valid operator. <coughs> Is it permission? <coughs> it's not obvious that it's a mission, uh, and if it isn't a mission, it certainly can't be the momentum operator. So let's 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 check that out. If we so let's write down the complex number phi p hat of psi. Let's let's evaluate this using this hocus pocus here. All right. So this is the integral dx. What am I going to do? I'm going to put an, e an identity operator just in here, made up of x's, right? Why? Because I know I've defined p in terms of what, it, what happens when it has an x on the left of it. So this is going to be phi x, x p hat psi. And now we can turn this into, into wave function language. This is the complex conjugate of the wave function uh, phi, so this is the integral dx of phi star of x, and we've defined what that is, it's minus i h bar d by dx of psi. So we can now integrate by parts, we're integrating minus infinity to infinity, so we can integrate by parts this, this partial derivative to get this partial derivative of psi and onto the phi. So what does that give me? Uh, we, get a, we get a square bracket term. We have a phi star, um, oh, and that Richard minus i, let's put the minus i h bar outside some vast bracket, right? So we're going to have a square bracket term now. Um, we're going to have an psi star, sorry, a phi star of psi minus infinity infinity. And then we're going to have minus uh, the integral dx d of psi, sorry, a psi d phi star by the x. Close the big bracket. So we can operate under the assumption that this thing vanishes. Now this is a rather hairy, don't, don't press too hard uh, as to whether this really does vanish, but the general idea is that the amplitude to find your particle at the edge of the universe is zero. So we dispose of this on the grounds that it is the amplitude to find the particle infinitely far away. We're going to say that that's zero. We will actually be working, you'll see quite soon, with some wave functions where that doesn't vanish. And this is an example where physicists are rather fast and loose. Uh, and, uh, but fortunately, this doesn't lead to any bad effects. So this we put in the bin. And this we can see is more or less what we want. Let's just tidy up a bit. So what is this that survives, including this minus ih bar? So we're going to have a minus, uh, well, let's leave the minuses out. Uh, we, uh, yep, uh, dx of a psi, and then we're going to have an i h bar d phi by dx. Supposing I take the star of all that, then I think I need a minus sign because this, coming, this minus will cancel on this minus. So we'll have an ih bar times this stuff with a psi starred. If I take that psi, that star, and put it around the whole caboodle, including the i, I'll need an additional minus sign to cancel the minus sign that will arise when that star is evaluated on here. And I can say now that that is the integral dx of psi star minus i h bar d phi by dx. Star. So if I take the star, this star, completely outside the whole thing, then <laughs> psi will need a star, which will be cancelled by the global star, uh, and otherwise everything will be okay. And what is this? This that we have in here, in, in Dirac notation, is a psi p hat phi, and that star sits outside. Right? What's inside the star is, is by definition this, so there we are. The answer is it is Hermitian, provided we get rid of that surface term, that, that, that minus infinite, the square bracket. 
One more, okay. Let's calculate the commutator x hat comma p hat. We're going to calculate it like this. In, so what we're going to do is calculate the action. So what we know at the moment is the action of p hat on any wave function. And we know the action of x on any wave function. So I want to work with wave functions, which means I, I put a bra at this end here, a bra x at this end here. And what does this give me? So this is going to be, obviously, x, x hat, p hat, of psi, minus x, p hat, x hat, of psi. No prizes for that. Um, Now, this, we've discovered x on this. Uh, we've discovered that x on any wave function, on any object, gives you x times the wave function you first thought of, the wave function you were operating on. What is the wave function that this produces? The wave function that this produces is minus i h bar d psi by the x. So we, all, we merely have to take that and multiply it by x, and then that's what you get there, right? This is a complex number depending on x. This is a complex number depending on x. So p on this is, is a certain wave function. It's this. And then x hat on that produces x times that wave function. So that's it. So here, same stuff. x on this is going to produce x of psi, x of psi. Uh, and then p on that is going to produce minus i h bar d by d x of that stuff. And there's a minus sign floating here. I mean, this minus sign is this. That minus belongs to the, to the p operator. So I think you can see that the x d psi by d x terms, when you differentiate out this product, you'll get two terms. You'll get x d psi by d x, which will cancel on this because of the two minus signs. And you will also get and psi times the derivative of x by, with respect to x, which is obviously 1. So we're going to get i h bar of psi of x, which can also be written as i h bar x whoops, of psi. So what have we learned? What we've learned is that for any state of psi whatsoever, we never said what it was, um, the wave function associated with x p of psi is simply i h bar times the wave function of psi. So that means that we can now write down an operator statement that x hat comma p hat is equal to i h bar. So the commutator of these two operators is a constant, small constant, but constant. And a, canonical, and a commutation relation of this sort is called a canonical commutation relation. We will meet other relations of this type where, where the commutator of two operators is equal to i h bar, and they will be declared canonical as well. The word, this canonical, of course, comes from classical mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics. Uh, and this arises because in classical mechanics, momentum is canonically conjugate, quote unquote, to, to x. Right. So now, now that we've done that, let's, you know, we've just got time, I think, to do this. Let's apply Ehrenfest's nice theorem to, so I'm, I'll begin, let's work out this, i h bar d by dt of the expectation value of x. What do you think this should be? The rate of change of the expectation value of x should be the speed, right? Did I say that right? The rate of change of the expectation value of x should be the, should be the speed, velocity, whatever. So we're hoping that this turns out to be i v, which should be i p upon m if, if, um, it's, if we're doing this right. According to Ehrenfest, what's this equal to? It's equal to a psi x hat comma Hamiltonian of psi. Right, that's Ehrenfest's theorem. Concrete example of, application of. So in order to go further, we need to say, so what's h? 
H is the energy operator. What do we know about the energy of, um, of some, um, of a particle that's moving in, possibly with some potential present, right? So uh, the, the energy should be a half, classically, classically, perhaps if we're doing this classically, I should replace this with an energy, should be a half m v squared plus the potential energy depending on x, which could also be written as the momentum squared over 2m plus the potential energy, right? Because P classically is mv. So let's, let's suppose that, the, that we can carry this forward into the quantum domain and say that the Hamiltonian operator is the momentum operator over 2m plus v, the function v evaluated on the position operator. Then we're going to have that ih bar dbdt of the expectation value of x hat is going to be the expectation value of uh, x commuted with p squared over 2m plus v but we know the, the, so this, but this commutator can be broken down into a sum of two commutators. The, commutation, the commutator of x with p and the commutator of x with v. But v uh, is a function of x, and therefore x, the, the position operator, is going to commute with this. So we're going to have that x comma v equals naught because v is a function of x. So what we're left with is what we're left with is the expectation value of P, P, sorry, expectation value of the commutator of X with P, P, of psi over 2M. Okay, I can take the 2M out of the commutator because it's just a number, and I can express P squared as PP, but we, discu we discussed probably yesterday what how we took the commutator of a product. Um, we, we used a rule analogous to differentiation uh, of a product. So this is equal to a psi um, onto x comma p commutator p standing idly by plus p standing I the first p standing idly by while x commutes with the second p. But we've discovered that this animal is, is a half, a, sorry, is, is IH bar, right? This is IH bar, and this is IH bar. IH bar is just a boring number, so it can come out front. So that becomes IH bar over 2M. And then we have P plus P, which is 2P, so I can rub out that 2, times So what have we discovered? We've discovered that we can cancel this IH bar on the right side with what we had on the left side and say that dBdt of the expectation value of the position is in fact equal to the expectation value of the momentum, what I claim is the momentum anyway, over m, which is exactly what we were hoping for, right? So we have recovered uh, the definition, well, the relationship between velocity and momentum which in classical, in Hamiltonian mechanics, is a rather, is a rather those of you who've done S7 will realize that the, that the connection between momentum and velocity is not as simple uh, as elementary Hamiltonian, sorry, em elementary Newtonian mechanics would lead you to believe. It, it can be quite subtle, and it's determined by this, which is one of, this is one of Hamilton's equations. What we've done is derived one of Hamilton's equations which supersede Newton's laws of motion in classical physics. So we derive from quantum mechanics a classical result which was already known, but this is the justification for Hamilton's equations. Because this is true, that Hamilton's equation is true. And we'll leave it on that, and tomorrow morning I'll start by deriving the other of Hamilton's equation, which is analogous to F equals MA.